Thank you for joining us for today's message. We believe we can go anywhere in the world from right here in Lamarck, Texas and reach people just like you. If you'd like more information about Abundant Life, please visit ALCC.org. You can also text the number below if you would like to support the church financially. Be ready for a powerful message that's gonna impact your life. Matthew chapter 21 and John chapter 12, for instance, in Luke chapter 21, uh, Luke 19, there are different places where you see this talked about. The book of Mark, Mark talks about it. And it's amazing that Jesus lived over 33 years uh, as a man on earth. God in flesh was over 33 years. It's interesting that, 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 that kind of follow with me on this thought for a moment. Because Palm Sunday initiated Jesus' declaration that his kingdom has, and his father's kingdom had begun to take over and to manifest again on the earth. It's very important to hear that. Uh, the scripture says, uh, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are 89 chapters in those four gospels that tell the life of Jesus. They tell his 33-year ministry or his 33-year life and his three, three and a half year ministry that is here. There's 89 chapters in those four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament. Uh, it's interesting to me that out of those 89 chapters, only four chapters talk about the first 30 years of his life. That's all, just four. There are 85 chapters that talk about Jesus' life in his last three and a half years. 85 chapters out of 89. Now out of those 85 that talk about Jesus' last three and a half years of ministry, 29 of those chapters talk about the last week of his life. That means almost a third of the New Testament is all wrapped up explaining one week. That week began on what we call Palm Sunday today. A third of the four Gospels, almost a third, are defined in there. It's probably one of the least spoken about things today and taught. But a third of those four Gospels almost deal with the week that began historically today. I believe it's necessary for us to understand the power of that. In the book of John, for instance, in chapter 12, there are 21 chapters in the book of John. And from the chapter 12 on, it talks about his last week. That's, that's something that ought to be very important that we ought to understand. Uh, in the book of Matthew, two-fifths of the entire gospel of Matthew deal with one week. Three-fifths of the book of Mark deal with one week. Almost half of the book of Luke deals with one week. And then the book of John. Oh my goodness. It's so necessary for us to see that. That God is trying to get something to us. A message to us that happened, that was initiated beginning in the last week of his life. In Matthew chapter 21, and I believe I'll just read it to you this morning. You'll let me get these little glasses on right here. In Matthew chapter 21, there's some powerful things that are taking place. One time someone said to me when I was in divinity school and when I was training uh, to study, they said, don't read the Bible, Pastor. If you read the Bible, uh, people won't get anything. I thought, if you fail to read the Bible, I promise you they won't get anything out of it. But listen to what Jesus did right here in Matthew chapter 21. I'm going to begin in verse 1 and just read for a minute. Read along with me. I'm reading out of a King James version of the Bible. And when they dwelt nigh unto Jerusalem, they came nigh to Jerusalem. This is Jesus and his disciples coming into Passover week. They were come to Bethphage under the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two of his disciples. And he said, go into the village over against you and, and straightway you will find an ass tied, a donkey, and a, and a little colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. I, I would just love to preach that. 
about God knows how to loose that wild animal that's tried to uh, disobey everything that God has for your life. But let's move on with this thought today. He said, if any man say anything to you, you shall say the Lord has need of them. And straightway he will send them. All this was done that it would be filled which was spoken by the prophet saying, tell you the daughter of Zion, behold your king. Come on, just say king with me today. Your king cometh into uh, you, comes to you meek and sitting upon uh, a donkey and a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. There's a miracle right there. Someone obeyed the Lord. And they brought the donkey and the colt and they put on them their clothes. They took their coats and put it on top of the donkey. And they sat Jesus thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. And others cut down branches and from the trees and threw them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and they that followed cried saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I'll read on a little further. Watch this. And when he came to Jerusalem, all the city was moved. And they said, who is this? And the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God. Watch this. And he cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple. And he overthrew the tables of the money changers. I'll explain it in a moment. And the seats of them that sold doves. Watch this. Jesus then said, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. I'll talk about that. Verse 14. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Let's talk about that in a moment. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that Jesus did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the Son of God, they were very displeased. And Jesus said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, Yes. Have you not read that out of the mouth of babes and sucklings you have perfected praise? Oh, we got to talk about that. And then he left them. Jesus then left them, the Bible says. And he went out of the city into Bethany and he stayed there. And in the morning as he returned into the city, he, he was hungry and he saw a fig tree in the way and he came to it. And he found nothing thereon but leaves only. We got to talk about that. And said unto it, he talked to a tree. He said, let no fruit grow on you henceforth forever and presently the fig tree withered away we have to talk about that and when the disciples saw it they marveled saying how soon the fig tree withered away immediately it had withered away and Jesus answered and said I say unto you if you have faith and doubt not you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree but also if you say to the mountain be thou removed and cast into the sea it shall be done and all things that includes coronavirus all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer believing you shall receive I believe we ought to talk about this for just a moment Jesus came in riding on a colt Zechariah 9.9 9 says he was fulfilling a prophecy that the Messiah would come in one day and one of the ways they would recognize that the world's Savior had shown up as he would come in riding on a colt and he would, have, he would have hope with him. He would have salvation. He would have peace with him. There would be a humility about why he was doing what he was doing and he would have the plan of salvation, Zechariah 9.9. 9. And Jesus, the Bible says, and we just read it in Matthew 21, fulfill that prophecy. Uh, it's interesting to note that the custom of that era, if a person, if a king was to visit another kingdom, uh, they would come in on a, if they were there just to visit for peace or for a relationship, 
they literally would get on a donkey or a, a, a colt of some kind and they would come in on a donkey and they would ride in symbolizing we're here for peace. We're not here for war. But if they were there trying to demonstrate their military and their position outranking that other city or that other king, they would get on their war stallion. But Jesus being the king of kings and declaring that your king is coming, the Bible says, he did not come in to make war. He came in for peace, to reconcile man back to God. If we read this story in the book of John chapter 12, it says the Greeks were there, not just the Jews, but the Greeks. And they said, we want to see Jesus. And so the Bible says they went to Philip, one of the disciples, who has a Greek name. That's not a Jewish name. That's a Greek name, Philip. They go to Philip, and Philip goes to Andrew. And then Philip and Andrew both go to Jesus. That's in John chapter 12, verbatim. That's how it happened. And the Scripture says, they said, we have some that are not Jews here that want to know about you. And then Jesus began to preach about his kingdom and how uh, he was going to do what was necessary. He began to reveal the fact that he is the king and that he has a kingdom that's not a political kingdom. It is an eternal kingdom that has no end and the government of the world is on his shoulders, Isaiah said. And he begins to ride in that day. I like to say he untied a donkey and then he attached him to the gates of heaven and he just pulled open the gate to the kingdom of heaven with a little donkey and began to announce, here comes the king. The king of kings and the Lord of lords. They were coming in, the Bible says, to a seven-day celebration, six days of, of feasting. It's a thousand-plus-year-old celebration. Can you imagine anything that's been going on for over a thousand years, a celebration? They were celebrating Passover which was when God had delivered the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt with the blood that had been placed on the doorpost. And now they are commanded three main feasts every year that they must keep for over a thousand years. Passover was the first one. We call it the Easter season, Passover. The second was Pentecost and the third was Tabernacles or Atonement. And those three were necessary can you imagine how things kind of morph and how they get out of hand and oftentimes they lose their, their actual purpose after a thousand years of something? Every year, it's the big feast. By this time, according to scriptures and history, the Passover celebration has become a major party in Jerusalem. All kind of things are going on. Many, many generations have come and gone. All they know is every year we get together at this time. And it's seven days of feasting and partying and celebrating and rejoicing because God set our ancestors a thousand years ago free. I can only imagine how it had lost much of its real meaning, its spiritual meaning because of the way it was being celebrated. And Jesus begins to come into the town and he stops before he goes in to Jerusalem and he tells two of his disciples, go get me a donkey and a little colt. One of them, I believe, rep represented uh, Israel. That's the, the donkey and the little colt, I believe, represented the Gentile. That may be you and me. I don't know if anybody listening to me is Jewish or not. But I'd like to tell you that God included both in his kingdom when he began to announce it on what we call Palm Sunday. That day in Jerusalem from all over Israel's territories, people were there because they were to come every year and celebrate. The city was packed. It was going to be a week long of, of feasting and celebrating and, and of temple going and, and all type of things are taking place. And then I can imagine the high priest and the rest of them thinking, this is our big day. This is, this is our Easter of the year. It is the time. And they are putting it on that day. And all of those people are around. And then Jesus gets on a little donkey. And he begins to ride into town. And the people said, that's Jesus of Nazareth. And then in John it says, they came because they wanted to know about Lazarus who he had raised from the dead. And they wanted to uh, see this miracle man. 
And instead of hanging out around the temple, crowds and multitudes begin to run out to the road where Jesus is riding in on a donkey. I'm sure that infuriated, infuriated the high priest. And all of their celebration plans that were going on, they wanted to know, who is this? And they said, it's Jesus of Nazareth. He's riding in on a donkey. Maybe one of the priests immediately thought, I understand what that means. Is he trying to make a statement? The answer is yes. He's fulfilling Zechariah 9.9 and those priests would have known that. That the king one day, the Messiah would come in and he would decree that he is Lord and he is king. And he's the same yesterday, today and forever. And he comes in that day and something began to happen in the spirit and the soul of all of Jerusalem that day. And the Bible says they took their coats and began to throw them on top of him. Uh, and they begin to throw them in the path in front. And they took li limbs and palm branches and they begin to pave the way. And they were saying, this coat represents my life. It represents my soul. Jesus, be over me. You be the king. This represents all of creation. These palm, you are the Lord of every. You're the king of kings. And they begin to make these statements. And then they begin to say things like this, Hosanna. We love that particular term because we think angels say it. But the Bible says it was people that were looking for the king of glory. Those who were wanting salvation, the justice of heaven in their life, forgiveness of sin. And they begin to get a little inkling of who Jesus might, could have been to them. And out of their inner man begin to come this cry, Hosanna. And Hosanna means let it happen now. Do it now. Now manifest it. Do it now. Do it now. We're with you. Here, here's our coat. Excuse me if I get a little excited, but how do you take a man that's on fire on the inside and tell him shut up, huh? Jesus is king. He's Lord. It's not an option. You get that revelation and you will... Throw your coat in front of him, so to speak. You'll say, Jesus, you're Lord of everything that I have. You're king of my life. You're king of creation. And they begin to declare things way beyond their own depth of revelation. They just had that, that inkling in their spirit. And the zeal and the joy of the Lord begin to come forth. That happened on Palm Sunday. When God manifested and began to reveal that his son is the king. And Jesus begins to come into town that day. And he's breaking a thousand years worth of custom and just religious rhetoric that's going on now. I believe there are two kinds of churches today. And I'm not here uh, hammering churches. I'm just talking. I believe there are religious custom churches. And I believe there are revelation churches. One of them gets a revelation of the kingdom of God which is real that you and I get to be a part of when Jesus is Lord. Another is like a museum. But guys, we're not just museum keepers. We are pilgrims and strangers. We are moving forward and expanding the territory of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, one soul at a time. It takes a revelation, that small, still voice revealing to you that Jesus is Lord. He is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. The next time Jesus comes back, the Bible says, He will come back not on a donkey. Revelation says He will come back on a white stallion. And He will come to declare war on the kingdom of darkness. And He will establish His kingdom here on earth one day. Right now, He's on the donkey. He's the King of Peace. He's the king that comes humbly saying, believe upon the Lord. The Bible says he comes in that day. And he didn't stop these people from saying, he's the king. He's, he's the Lord. Uh, Hosanna to him. He didn't tell them, stop doing that, stop doing that. This time, more than once he did say, hold your peace, hold your peace. This time he didn't do it. It was on what we call Palm Sunday, the last week of his life. He begins to reveal and let people begin to declare it out. And the body of Christ, the churches of the Lord Jesus have been declaring it boldly ever since then and will not be shut up. We are living in a day right now 
where the kingdom of God must be manifested. The kingdom of darkness with sickness and all of those things is attacking our planet. But the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is alive forevermore. And he's looking for someone to say, Hosanna, to say, now God, manifest yourself. Heal, deliver, save, set free your people. That's what it's all about. Our adversary means it for evil, but God can turn it to good, the Bible says. Today, people are calling upon the Lord. They are praying. They are saying yes to Jesus. Today, churches are beginning to pray and seek God in a way they have not done. Many of them in decades. They're seeking God. In the spirit, they know something's not right. Our nation, our world has gone upside down, but God is the God who makes things right side up. He always has been. He always will be. He's alive forevermore. Listen to this. When Jesus comes into Jerusalem that day, in Matthew chapter 21, my time's about up, but you've got to hear this. I believe it's powerful. The first thing he did after riding in and the declaration being made that he is king of kings and lord of lords. And the people are crying, God, do it right now. The Bible says he goes into the temple and he purges for the sake of purity because their religious custom had gotten so far out of whack that the real purpose of that Passover was not even being seen. And he begins to purify, I believe today, as God begins to deal with your heart, as God deals with churches all over today that name the name of Jesus, that God will purify things in those houses that are not of, of Him, if we can yield to Him. He turned over the tables of the money changers. The money changers were those who would sell the sacrifices. Every year they would have to bring a sacrifice. They were supposed to bring a sacrifice that meant something to them a lamb or a goat of some kind. It was supposed to have value to them. But many people decided, well, I'll just go to the temple and I'll just buy a goat. And they would buy and sell the goats there. And that goat didn't have any meaning to them. And they would give their money and they would exchange it and they would get what they have and they would pay the priest for that. Listen to me. God's not interested in your money. He's interested in your soul. It's about the relationship. That sacrifice was supposed to mean something. And Jesus came in that day on Palm Sunday. And he turned that table over. And he began to declare, no, no, no. You're robbing God of his glory. He said, you've made it a den of thieves. It wasn't about dollars. It's about relationship. He's telling them, you've cheapened the offering." supposed to mean something to you you're stealing from people if you don't teach them about the reality of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God it's not religious rhetoric it's not just thousands of years of custom it's relationship it's knowing Jesus personally every time you pray Every time you seek God, every time you give a gift, let it mean something in your heart. Talk to God about it. Don't just tip God. Don't just have a, an occasional conversation with the man upstairs. That's ridiculous. You're talking about the Savior of the world. How hard is it with you to get an audience with the banker? How hard is it to get an audience with the mayor? How hard... Is it to get an audience with the senator? Jesus made a way where you can get an audience with the creator of heaven and earth. He's alive forevermore. It ought to have the greatest honor in your life. The greatest place of endearment. He turned over all of those other customs. And then the Bible says he made a decree. He said, my father's house shall be known as a house of prayer. I'm talking about a house of prayer. You know, if you go to a house of clothing, there's all kind of clothes there. You go to a house of shoes, there's all kind of, of shoes they, they have there. They have tennis shoes, they have the high dollar shoes, the low dollar shoes. 
They've got high dollar clothes, men's clothes, women's clothes, children's clothes. It's a house of clothes. Jesus said, my father's house is a house of prayer. There's the prayer of salvation, the prayer of repentance, the prayer of worship, the prayer of binding and loosing, the prayer of praise, the prayer of intercession. There's the prayer of the Spirit. It's a house of prayer. Where do men learn about that? It's in the house of God. It's in the Father's house. It begins with a revelation of the King. His name is Jesus. It is real. Eternity is real. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Men must repent of their sin, turn from unrighteousness, and ask God to save them and to reconcile them back to God through repentance and then picking up your cross. That means the fact that I have died. Here's the sign spiritually that I have died to myself and I have now come alive. That cross is empty today. Jesus bore that for you and me, but we carry that cross every day in our life. The scripture says, after he had purified, and then he taught the message of prayer, then all that were sick and lame in the temple, he healed them all, the Bible says. I like to call that his power. He said, this is what the king can do in your life. I can purify your life. I can give you communication and relationship with God. And I have the power to meet your need. That's what Jesus did on Palm Sunday. The scripture says, Then the children begin to cry out and say, Hosanna, even the children. And the Bible says, Jesus said, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, little infants, you have perfected praise. I love that word. You and I can't come to God all stiff and stuffy and all high-browed and all of those. When you come to the King of Kings, what do you have to offer Him other than your soul? He owns everything. When you humbly say, Jesus, I magnify your name like a little child, innocent, pure in your spirit, you have to humble yourself to come before God. You humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and the Holy Spirit will lift you up. He'll give you a new heart. He'll give you a new soul. If He did it for me, He'll do it for you. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, He has perfected praise. I wish I had time to break that down in the Greek for you, but it says it like this. He has used praise to set everything in order and set it in motion. He said it's out of that praise. He just activates How did Jesus say pray in Matthew 6? He said, start out with our Father which art in heaven. Glory and honor to your name. Hallowed be your name. He perfected prayer. He sets it in order by praising with a pure heart, with that innocent heart. They said, Hosanna. They said, God, right now we want that relationship with you. The scripture says the next thing Jesus did is he begins to show that path. He left and began to take that path, showing that we walk with God. It's not a one-time experience. And his disciples said, Jesus, you talked to a fig tree and you told it to not bear fruit anymore because all it had were leaves. Leaves represent religious custom. Leaves are maybe the identifier that we have without the fruit. He said, it's full of leaves, but there's no fruit on it. He said, no man eat from you any longer. He said, I'm killing the dead religious manifestation. And I'm looking for men and women who will manifest the fruit of God. Salvation, love, joy, peace, healing, praise from a pure heart. We don't have any record of Jesus ever telling a mountain to to go somewhere. But Jesus said... This is how your faith will work. When you join my kingdom, if you tell the fig tree to die, that little, small, ineffective thing, that which is just covering and hindering what should be there, you get that out of your life, he said, that'll leave. And when that happens, you can tell the mountains that are in your life to get out of the way. The mountain of coronavirus, go in Jesus' name. 
That's what he said. Sickness, fear. That has to go and God brings peace and joy. And he brings salvation and a new life. The big mountain. Hell. That's in front of every man and woman. But when you get rid of just religious custom and you call upon Jesus the King to be your Lord. He said, now watch how your faith starts moving the other things out of the way. I'll give you eternal life. That's what Jesus said. I believe my time is up. And on this beautiful Palm Sunday in these few minutes that we've had together, I'm asking you today, would you say yes to Jesus Christ? Right in your home where you are. Out in the parking lots. In front of your computers today. The gospel is not hindered. The Holy Spirit is right where you are today. Have you ever given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you allowed Him to turn over religious ideology that may be steeped in something good, but it's lost its purpose in your life today? How about a relationship with Jesus Christ? Jesus activated that. And revealed it the last week of his life. We're going into this passion week right now. But we're not going in uninformed. No, we're going in because Easter is on the way. And we know Jesus already is alive. But we're going to celebrate. And we're going to humble ourselves before him. We're going to repent from all sin. We're going to worship his name. We're going to pray. We're going to praise. And then we're going to walk that path with Him. That path of faith. And if anything gets in our way, coronavirus, financial problems, relational friendships, family issues, we're going to pray in Jesus' name. And we're going to speak to those mountains. We're going to speak to those barrenless trees. We're going to say, you have to move in Jesus' name. You've got to get out of the way. I'm following the King. Hosanna. Jesus, manifest yourself now. Let your name be exalted. Would you pray with me right now? I believe right in the houses where people are, there are people right now just putting their hand on their heart. Maybe someone's getting on their knees. Would you just pray right now? Let me lead you in this prayer. Say this with me, please. Heavenly Father, I give my life to Jesus Christ. Jesus, be my King. Be my Lord. Save my soul. Write my name in your book of life. I will take up my cross and I will follow you Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for your blood being applied to my life. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your word in my heart today. I am a Christian. By faith, I follow Jesus from this time on. In Jesus' name, amen. To learn more, visit WalterHallam.net. Here you'll find a list of resources to help you with your daily walk in Christ.